We are uh, more than halfway in our course, and today, I was, uh, as I was anticipating you, <coughs> we uh, will uh, switch from uh, a generic presentation of the R language and uh, uh, workbench and the uh, connected workflows doing uh, the kind of uh, data manipulation or statistics you need, and we will start concentrating to close up on our target on using R for modeling species distribution. As you uh, are seeing in uh, the topics of uh, this afternoon, uh, is not uh, simply using R. Uh, every now and then uh, we will have a look behind the scenes because uh, uh, doing that you will be prepared to uh, what Francesco will uh, show uh, tomorrow using directly R. So we will skip all the theory uh, or the inner workings of R and uh, um, give for granted that everyone is, 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 is true, uh, isn't it, uh, is able to use R. Because the trick is not just using R, but as you, as you see in the two highlighted row in the slide, uh, using a specialized R package, which is called uh, rather fun in a, in a funny way, Dismo, uh, which means distribution modeling. You know, computer people uh, love shortening up things. So, uh, Dismo is not uh, the only package uh, that can be used to do species distrib distribution modeling. There are lots of packages. Uh, Dismo uh, is one of the first and is one of the most widely used. Uh, Francesco will go into the details tomorrow. Dismo is a pack package in R that makes R able to talk with the Maxent program. Maxent is a standalone program. You can run it by itself on your computer. It's written in Java, and uh, this guarantees that when it runs, uh, because Java is uh, beginning to show its age as a programming language, uh, that when, when it runs, it is able to run on any kind of computer, like R do. So no problems if you have uh, a Windows-based machine, a Linux-based machine, or an Apple uh, computer, because uh, both R and Maxent uh, run on any kind of uh, computer. So let's start reasoning on what does it mean making a species distribution model? Because the uh, theoretical background behind species distribution modeling uh, is forcibly the same, notwithstanding the kind of modeling tool you use. We will use R uh, as a tool to uh, better exploit the fu functions present in the uh, Maxent program, you know. Maxent uh, has been uh, developed to be an interactive program. So you use it using your mouse and click here and there, and then the last click you do is on a button with run or whatever, or something like that written above. Problem is that when you have to rerun Maxent, the Java one, I mean, a second time, uh, you start wasting time because you have to prepare everything again. Uh, just to make uh, a sort of uh, comparison, uh, it, it's like if uh, every night when you have to go to bed, you have to go out and buy a new bed, which is rather absurd. R works as a secretary to uh, the Maxent program. It helps us to prepare all the data you need to run the model. Uh, creates a sort of harness who holds the reins of the Maxent programs and store all the results on the disk. So if you want to do two, three, four more runs 
for instance, uh, because you have to do species distribution models for more than a single species in the same area, uh, it's really more handy uh, and productive using R as an interface towards the Maxant program. So, without uh, any further ado, let's uh, have a look at what is the. You remember one, uh, one slide that Francesco showed uh, last week, the one about the laundry cycle of uh, data management. Uh, you import data, you condition data, then you do some exploratory analysis, uh, and then uh, you uh, fix uh, the uh, unavoidable errors you have in your, you may have in your data, and then you do some analysis, and then you do some plot. This is the basic workflow for any kind of uh, uh, data job. Today, uh, this afternoon, uh, our data job is a more defined one. We have to build a map, substantially. We have to create a raster map. I don't know how uh, many of you are familiar with JS software, but uh, this is not a problem. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we use behind the, the scenes in some way another piece of software with a GIS uh, a program intended to make and prepare maps uh, because to do species distribution model we have to uh, use R also as a mapping software and R uh, is able to do almost anything. Uh, Francesco told you about the uh, or Vittoria, I don't remember, told you about the coffee. You know, here in this part in the south of Europe, uh, we like coffee and not tea. The tea Europe is uh, in Britain and uh, moving toward Russia. <laughs> We drink beer and coffee. So the idea is to obtain data. I'm uh, thinking at the basic uh, data analysis workflow Francesco showed you last week, but those data are of two kinds. Distribution, where we have seen, where we are sure that at least one individual of our species is present on one hand, and on the other hand, the habitat. More, uh, more correctly, the environment, because we are not sure that any part of our study area is properly habitat. So, habitat can be anything, elevation, soil type, precipitation, uh, how many people inhabit here, how many people has green sockets, I don't know, whatever. No? Uh, this also means that we will need some help before running the model to tidy up uh, in some way our data, both distribution data and environmental data. Making species distribution maps is not a novelty at all. Uh, first, because this kind of modeling techniques dates uh, uh, from uh, the more or less year 2005. So, uh, it's uh, already almost 20 years old. But the idea of mapping species distribution, uh, if you remember something, I, I remember something confusedly of my uh, biogeography courses when I was at university as a student. It was uh, all the fault of this old guy, the, the man behind Darwin, remember, uh, Wallace uh, was the one who uh, spoon up Darwin to wrote uh, his books because he uh, noticed it. He was working uh, in uh, what today is, uh, is Indonesia, Malaysia, and whatever, uh, in the Far East for us. Uh, and uh, he was mapping species distribution on paper, of course. And uh, so that there were strange patterns. There were areas in where there were may, more, much uh, more many species than one can, uh, can foresee looking around at other area. That kind uh, of uh, distribution in that part of the world is still called Wallacea, uh, the name of the, the Indonesian region, uh, because Wallace worked there and f uh, was from there that he uh, wrote that famous letter to Charles Darwin uh, that moved Darwin to hurry up and uh, publish uh, 1959 the first edition of the origin of the species. Uh, so, 
uh, if Darwin is uh, to be considered the modern father of evolution, uh, Wallace uh, is the father of biogeography. That is the this, this science of mapping where a species is, not an individual, uh, but uh, uh, the entity above, a species, that, uh, that is all the extant population of uh, that uh, kind of species. What's the use of mapping uh, species distribution? More correctly, in our case, of predicting species distribution. You know, the people uh, whose job is making uh, weather forecasts, my job and Francesco's job and possibly uh, also yours, is making species forecasts. So, uh, instead of mapping uh, uh, precipitation, rain, snow and wind, we will map uh, where uh, a species can be. This is different from what uh, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace did, because uh, Wallace, in modern terms, uh, did what we can call a presence only or a just presence mapping. Uh, he uh, uh, drew on his maps all the location where at least uh, one individual of that species was present, and then connected the dots. Uh, remember this concept? We will go back to that uh, in uh, a few minutes. Just uh, uh, some minutes to reflect on what's the use of having species distribution maps, both actual distribution uh, and uh, predicting, that is, probability of presence uh, by and large for a given species. You can see a short summary. Uh, I can go on for hours. Uh, adding things to this list, but uh, other than uh, setting up and consolidating a knowledge base, uh, which is doing science on uh, the distribution of that species we're working on, uh, if we can have some details on the inside of the species distribution, uh, because assuming as Wallace uh, uh, not, not uh, noted uh, uh, from start, uh, the uh, polygon you draw on the map is not homogeneous and inside. There are better and worse areas. There are more suitable hab habitats for uh, species. There are marginal areas and so on. So if our uh, mapping exercise is something more, and it will be, you'll see uh, tomorrow, uh, that uh, gives uh, to uh, the uh, predicted distribution area of a species, also a score ranking, uh, uh, say, from 0 to 100%, uh, the solution we obtain, the map we have, is how good is uh, this place, put your finger on the map in any place, uh, for the species we are studying. We can use these maps for a lot of tasks. Uh, for instance, uh, I started uh, more or less 25 years ago to do uh, species distribution modeling with other techniques, we will see, uh, to uh, use them for game management. Where are the places where hunters can go uh, hunting without uh, depleting the existing populations? The better areas, of course. Where are those better areas? Make a map. So. Uh, if you uh, start making maps for more than one species, you can use them together and answer to more articulated questions uh, like uh, where the distribution of two species that I know have the same ecology are uh, superimposed, uh, maybe in those areas those two species are competing for the same resources, or uh, I can make a map uh, for the potential distribution of our species, Homo sapiens, and for whatever uh, other species uh, you want. The last time I did that, it was for the brown, uh, brown beer, uh, and where the, they superimpose, there are possibly conflict. The example I will use, uh, uh, just not to spoil your data, you will see them tomorrow with Francesco, is uh, this kind of exercise where uh, I mapped uh, on one hand the uh, potential distribution of brown bear 
in a selected region in northern Italy, the Alps, a mountain area, and the other species I mapped was a particular subspecies of Homo sapiens, who's known as the beekeeper, you know, honey and birds. It means damages for the beekeepers. So the example I will use to introduce you to not just a species distribution modeling, but which is more important, its applications is a problem uh, linked to applied wildlife management on one hand and to better address a human activity such as beekeeping is. So you've seen uh, distribution atlases. Uh, maybe at the end of this year we will have for the first time, don't laugh, we in Italy are rather slow, we will have for the first time the Italian mammals, mammal distribution atlas. Uh, this uh, uh, is uh, yeah, at the bottom right an excerpt for the fox, for the red fox, Vulpes Vulpes, uh, a map on the rather oldish uh, but still actual uh, European mammal atlas. And you see the dots. I warned you, we have to connect the dots, the dots most of the time. So, in many cases, you see uh, in modern wildlife, birds, mammals, uh, amphibians, whatever, uh, also plants, why not? There are also botanists doing this kind of exercise in mapping. You see this kind of maps either, as in the upper part of the slide, made with a, with a polygon. A colleague of mine called that a blotch. Just like you are um, taking a brush, uh, 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 dip that in, a, in a, some colored ink and make some blotches at random, or mostly, on the map. And uh, at bottom right, you see the dots, which uh, makes us aware that who made this map didn't use simply a brush to make, to make blotches on the map, but at least decided to divide the study area, in this case uh, for uh, the fox in Europe, Europe, in squares which are not squares, you know, because the Earth is absolutely uh, anything but not flat, so you cannot rest, uh, draw squares on the Earth's surface, they are trapezoids, actually. But for each square, uh, someone went in, like Wallace did uh, 200 years ago, and uh, searched and searched and searched and made uh, a tick, a dot, if uh, at least one fox was spotted there. So you see that, I don't know, in, uh, who's that, in, in, in uh, Romania, where's the, my, my pointer? Here, in uh, Romania, uh, there are uh, a few foxes. Uh, and here in uh, the Poplain, uh, one of the most inhabited areas in Italy, there are no fox at all. Quite, quite doubtful, because you know, uh, now fox uh, are one of the best scavengers of trash we have in uh, urban areas. So much for just draw, drawing maps without making any statistical inference, without making any kind of calculation. This is the way a distribution map is made since the age of Wallace. You go on the field, you go in our lab outside, you collect observation the more observations you collect, the better, but up to a certain limit, because uh, enough is enough. If you have too many observations, they become uh, redundant. I already know that in that area, uh, a platypus, let's change species, <coughs> it's more funny than the fox, a platypus is present. So uh, if you spend uh, one or two years <coughs> going to see platypuses, you can come out with this kind of distribution. First, the platypus is present only in Australia, and we already know this since kindergarten, but only in the western part of Australia. Why? Why? You know where a species is present, but you know nothing about the drivers behind that. So you know what well, is the reality, but you uh, uh, did not accumulate knowledge to go Farther on to make prediction to explain the reasons behind that pattern 
of presence. And this was and still is the big problem that was just in this part of the world, a tad north here, this is the Wallacea, uh, Borneo, uh, Indonesia and the like, uh, noted. There are several places where we have more biodiversity. Now that the correct name is this, the term biodiversity did not exist at uh, Wallace time. Why? We have uh, biodiversity hotspots, for instance. The idea is this one. This, again, this uh, scheme here is, again, the uh, laundry cycle uh, we use for data when we uh, are laundering species distribution. Collect data. You have to collect lots of data. It can take it can takes years to collect those data. So you have to think carefully to archival. You have to uh, plan carefully how you uh, start now storing data you will use to make a model in the next five years. Which kind of computer we will have in the next five, five years? I don't know. <laughs> but I, will have, I know that we, have, uh, we will have to use that kind of computer to uh, use the information we have started gathering now with the tools we have now. And you produce distribution maps, blotches like this one, or dots like the fox I've shown you before. Problem is how nowadays we do this uh, in a quantitative fashion, not simply using a brush and blotching on a piece of paper or using a, a graphics uh, program and uh, drawing uh, by, by hand on our screen. Not a thing, it's not a bad habit, it's not wrong uh, blotching on the screen. A qualified person who has experience, years of experience working, uh, studying um, this spe uh, one species, can uh, succeed in predicting, knowing both the ecology of the species he is study, studying uh, from years and knowing well that kind of area uh, where uh, the, this kind of uh, by hand mapping exercise is uh, occurring, uh, an expert of the species is able to uh, draw something that when compared with uh, what I'm talking about this afternoon to you, that is a calculated distribution, there are really small differences. Problem is that um, no one up to now uh, invented a system to pull out uh, of the head of the expert the knowledge which surely is inside. So we have to resort to a more quantitative approach. Don't be scared of this scheme, uh, but this is all the workflow we need and all the tools we need to make species distribution model with a computer and a pair of computer software. As you will see, we need two different data sources. I'm in the top part of this flowchart, and you see in, uh, in orange, in whatever kind of uh, orange-like color your screen is uh, rendering this figure, at top left we have species data. The Wallace inheritance points for small polygon. Someone went there, and we are sure that there, at least a small population, at least an individual, has been seen. So analysis, uh, analysis are, are made for birds, mostly for birds. Uh, birds are, are, are easy to spot. You know, they sing. Uh, mammals, reptiles, whatever, or uh, uh, ad hoc surveys when you have to map an elusive species, uh, a scarcely known species, a species at risk of extinction and whatever, you uh, start the modeling exercise in the field with a lot of people starting a data collection scheme because uh, you know for first that uh, you know almost nothing on uh, that species distribution. So uh, the first half of the data you need is distribution data, where the species is. 
On the other hand, the second and last data source you need are data dealing with the environment. How our study area is made, dealing with uh, as many uh, traits as possible. Elevation, uh, land cover, human presence, uh, just one road networks. Uh, you have to gather as much in uh, geographic information as possible to have the best description you can of any place inside your area. This is loosely if you think, related to the, to the concept of habitat. More correctly, but uh, we will deal with that just in the next slide, with the concept of ecological niche. So, you store both presence points and habitat potential descriptor into a GIS, that is a geographical information system, that is a computer program used to make maps, but also to store data that can be used to make maps. We are not, uh, don't, not making any map at all, of course. If you use the GIS roughly and plot your uh, presence data on your environmental data, you are doing nothing more, uh, nothing different uh, than the work that Wallace did to uh, 100 years ago. You are doing that using a computer, not paper and pencil, but the concept is absolutely the same. But if you use R, for instance, that is, if you start analyzing, making statistical inferences on those data, you can extract from the environmental data some kind of information because the reason behind this kind of analysis is, is if someone spotted at least an individual in that area, that means that that area is habitat for the species. That area has possesses all the characteristics that are uh, uh, that make uh, exactly that area suitable for uh, a given number of individual of uh, that species to live in, to uh, thrive, to rip, even to, to to breed, to reproduce in that area. So I can use my uh, statistical analysis tools to extract in some way how exactly those area good supposed good for that species are and go check all the rest of the map that is all the places where no one went check if uh, uh, at least uh, uh, an individual was present repeat this kind of exercise for a given number of species uh, sufficiently high number of species all in the same area, sum up the maps and you have a single map that we can call biodiversity map because species richness uh, is, uh, you know, the uh, simplest form uh, to measure biodiversity. So this is the uh, workflow. Uh, just to introduce uh, the characters of this work, with their proper name, presence data, species data are called presence data. Note presence, the presence term, absence is a problem, and we uh, talk about this. And what are called environmental data are usually called AGV, ecogeographical variables. There are lots of uh, acronyms, but we will survive acronyms. So the idea is that we are using. Uh, on one hand, a, a map making software, and on the other hand, a statistical, a multivariate statistical analysis software. So we are dressing R uh, uh, on one hand as a GIS, and on the other hand, as a multivariate uh, analysis software to measure and replicate the ecological niche of uh, our studied species. And the concept of niche we are using is exactly that old concept uh, set up by Hutchinson in the 50s. The, uh, Hutchinson defined the, the ecological niche. If you remember, this, uh, this is a pure theory 
first year of university for me, the ecology course, uh, a species lives in a multidimensional space. Each dimension, you see the here in uh, this uh, picture rather well, uh, uh, the, the uh, possibility of thriving, of surviving for uh, uh, any individual of uh, an hypothetical species we are studying depends on uh, the elevation uh, the presence of a certain kind of grass. Uh, um, it depends of uh, being not too uh, uh, near to roads and so on. The more niche dimensions you are aware of and you are able to measure, the better you will uh, know the fingerprint of the niche. Uh, as you will remember, there are uh, actually two niche, the potential niche uh, in uh, light gray here and realize the actual niche because there are parts of the study area that are unaccessible to the species or they are uh, suitable but not the best and whatever. This kind of niche measuring exercise is easily made using mapping software, GIS, I mean, because uh, species uh, presence are just points and like uh, they do in uh, in Great Britain every uh, um, Friday night at the pub, uh, you know, they play darts. Uh, you uh, throw darts uh, in a target and make a hole in a, in a target. That is, you use points that are your arrows and throw them in a pack of maps, one for elevation, one for distance from road, one uh, for presence of prey and whatever, and you see where the dart, the point of presence, every single point of presence you have made a hole in the map and you can measure uh, how high was that place, the elevation, how distant from the nearest road was it, uh, if there were uh, rivers uh, nearby and at uh, what distance and whatever. This kind of uh, measuring job based on a location is the bread and butter of any GIS mapping programs. Furthermore, we will see that uh, <coughs> this kind of measures uh, more often, since we live in uh, 2022, are already made for use. So, in a nutshell, doing species distribution models is first being able to measure and quantify the realized niche of a species, and second, if we succeeded in step one, finding where this kind of niche space is on our map. So, a workflow can take shape based on this concept. First, we have to size up the niche. We have to use presence data to measure where is the habitat, now I'm using the correct term because where a species is optimal or suboptimal is habitat. Indeed, habitat is if the species is present. We have to study the relationship between each and, and ecogeographical variables and data. And questions in the, this second step are of the kind that we have several dimensions, dimensions of the niche but they are not all equal. Uh, elevation is more important in determining the, proba in determining the probability of, a, uh, of presence of a species. is more important the elevation or the dist or distance from the road. Uh, rainfall uh, has any kind of importance uh, and is, oh yes, is important, but it's more, more or less important than the average temperature of the coldest month and whatever. So the idea is use presence data to size up the niche through the collection of eco of several ecogeographical variables we have. Understand the role, the importance, the proportional importance from zero to one hundred percent of each and any ecogeographical variable, and formally. Look uh, at bottom right in the slide. Formally, summarize it up as an equation. You know, we are sci scientists. Uh, we make equation every now and then. Also, zoologists make equations. 
and the base equation is that one you can see at bottom uh, right. The probability of presence, that is a number between zero and one, which is uh, never zero and never one, but something in between, the probability of presence of a given species is a function of some ecogeographical variables. I don't know if just one or ten, but is an f of several x, f of a g piece problems. This is pure theory, and you know, uh, from theory and practice, uh, often there is an abyss. So let's look at the uh, leftmost column presence, first source of problem. We uh, often, always, uh, I would dare saying, uh, can have just information on presence of a species and not absence. Because if you think about it, we can be 100% sure a species is in a given place. Uh, we have been beaten by an individual. We have seen. Uh, at least an individual, but this is not true for absence. This is called the pseudo-absence problem, because if we go out like Wallace did at the end of uh, the 19th century and look desperately for any possible sign of presence of the species we are searching, two things can happen. And we cannot tell which one actually happened. That is, the species was actually indeed absent, wasn't here. It, we are out of the distribution. We are out of the, that place is not habitat. The species and us did not meet because the species wasn't present there. But that's the second case. The species actually was present, but is an elusive species, is a cryptic species. We went out to look uh, for a species uh, in a um, time of the day where that species is less active. Uh, in one word, we were both there, but we did not meet each other, which is not absence. It's a sort of um, misunderstood presence, but it's impossible to distinguish between those two kind, real present, real absence, pardon me, and uh, real absence. Simply, you go out in the field, uh, you don't spot uh, any individual. Uh, the, the reasons can be two, real absence, you didn't meet. So, a presence is always certain, uh, like uh, the ancient Romans told about the, their mother, mater semper certa. They said, you know, the mother is always certain, the father not. Uh, the father is our uh, absence information. This is a problem, not just for us. Uh, I, I'm surviving as a species distribution modeler from, uh, for years. It's a problem for statisticians, because if you want to calculate a probability, maybe uh, also, some of you has been told that uh, uh, in a basic statistic course, probability is a fraction, is uh, uh, how the number of cases for a given event that are uh, what you are interested in, divided by the total number of cases. Uh, this is the most simple definition of probability, and in our case, uh, the total number of cases is all the times I went out searching for my species at the denominator of the fraction and the numerator, the number of favorable cases, is all the presence point. You know that uh, it is evident that it's obvious that you have to make this kind of calculation. You have to be sure of the absences and we are not. We cannot be. So we have uh, the statistician who is asking for absence, but we from the field can bring the statistician only random sampling. We went there, we met, we went there, 
we did not met. I don't know for which reason. This is the basic, the biggest problem in species distribution model. So uh, some theorists tell that you cannot call that probability of presence because you don't have absences. So you cannot measure uh, probability of presence. Is an index, is a proxy of the probability of presence, is an habitat suitability index. On the other hand, let's have a look at the right, uh, at the column uh, to the right, we have also a problem with that bloody F. P of presence is an F of X. Which kind of F? A square? A square root? Uh, which function? You know, a computer is called computer because it's able to compute, to make calculation. Uh, we can uh, ask our computer to uh, relate uh, the uh, presence points to the eco-geographical variable in any possible kind. Uh, you can go uh, on forever trying to apply different functions of the eco-geographical variable. Problem is that the um, single uh, eco-geographical variable with presence points can have different shapes. That is, the shape of our, I'm going back uh, pair of slide here there we are the shape of our ecological niche is not a cube or an hypercube if you like a multi-dimensional spaces is uh, something like an, a multi-dimensional potato if you are of this kind of metaphor because um, our species can depend uh, linearly with uh, by the elevation but uh, uh, there's a logarithmic effect uh, in uh, uh, distance from roads and so on. And we don't know the exact species uh, ecogeographical variable relation until we don't start studying. Uh, furthermore, we are certain from the start that, that all ecogeographical variables are not made equal. Uh, we are also interested, one of the questions we are searching answer for is uh, how uh, is the way, what are the weights of uh, each uh, and every ecogeographical variables? Next, there is the data variability problem because uh, it's true that we are in uh, 2022, that we are in the full blooming of the ne so called neo geography. You can find any kind of map data. Uh, on the internet, uh, it's embarrassing. When I started, uh, I had to go in the local administration offices pleading for map, begging for maps. Uh, now I don't move from my seat. Uh, Victoria knows it, knows it well because you can download, download anything you want uh, talking about map data. Problem so becomes uh, the problem you have when you have too much of a thing, which data to use, because I have plenty of data and I have the suspect that most of them are useless, are, are not niche parameters. That is to say, I can use them as niche parameters, but their weight is zero. So a problem on the, the side, on the right side of our equation, on the eco-geographical variable is double. Which kind of function is best to use and which pack of uh, eco-geographical variable, uh, given the, the, the high number uh, you can download, uh, is the best set. And as uh, uh, an, an ancient uh, Italian said uh, four or five hundred years ago, I'm talking about a certain Galileo Galilei, and yet it moves who is a fake because uh, because uh, that story in the in one of the churches of Pisa where uh, a lamp was moving and inspired the pendulum uh, looks like it never happened but we love this kind of phrase and yet it moves you can see here this is a, um, a graph from the PhD thesis of a Swiss chap uh, not related to Galileo at all because it was uh, from Switzerland you know uh, here's them who was one of the first to uh, uh, use a formal approach 
to uh, species distribution modeling. Maxent uh, came out in 2005, three years after the PhD thesis of Hirze, who was studying a species that uh, has uh, a very, very narrow ecological niche, the alpine ibex. And in blue, you see the distribution, I don't know, of elevation of a single ecogeographical variable in, in his study area, Switzerland, and in red, the same distribution, but measured using only presence point for ibexes. That is to say, the average uh, mountain elevation of Switzerland is this one, uh, MS in the slide here. But ibexes prefer to stay at, in a certain elevation range, which is less than the available. So it's not a high mountain species. If you plot, plot random measurements from your study area and the measurement of the same, same uh, ecogeographical variable uh, coming from the points where your species is, you always obtain plots like this. Another example, we are uh, here in uh, Northern California and the species uh, uh, I used from this paper is a, a mouse. In green, the points where species presence has been measured, so the geographic space, let's call it this way, this is the map. A map is something that uh, is done in the geographic space. And here we move in the niche, multidimensional space, the environmental space, the space where the, the eco-geographical variables are quantified. The points now are uh, still green or bluish or whatever, uh, but are not latitude and longitude, are the, uh, I don't know, uh, precipitation, mean, mean annual precipitation rainfall in millimeters. So this is the range of rainfall where uh, our mouse in Northern California stays. And in red, the whole rainfall uh, range of the study area, okay? So, in this case, the means are more or less the same. And this can mean that rainfall is not important for our species. The idea is we can deal with the niche measurement, but we cannot deal with absence. But we can work with presence against random. Presence against the entire study area. So, the modern way of uh, playing, uh, playing Wallace, making distribution map, works any kind of tool you will use, and Maxent is not an exception, exactly as you can see in this slide. You start in the geographical space, you move to do measurements in the environmental space, in the niche space, you make your measurement, and with your measurement at hand, you go back to geographical space and apply your measurement. That is, you see here, uh, bottom right, that a, an, an orange line appeared on, uh, this is a, a cross section of the mountain, figured out like this. So I climb up to the mountain here, 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 in this green dot, I meet, uh, I met an individual of my species. And in this place, precipitation was low and temperature was high here. So I can have, uh, let's uh, do this example with just two ecogeographical variables, temperature and rainfall. So each point here has its twin in the niche space. So like I can plot, plot points on a map, and like Wallace did, um, make a polygon around them and say this is a distribution of our species, I can do 
uh, a similar thing in the unknown mental space, making, finding, uh, telling my computer to look for and find uh, the smallest possible polygon, an envelope is the correct name, that uh, uh, indeed envelopes, wraps all our points. Some points, some points can be too far. Uh, you know, every now and then, there is some individual who uh, doesn't behave like the others, and this technique to uh, actually find out the, the niche in the environmental space uh, allows us also to exclude extreme valued points, that is, points maybe at the border of the distribution. So, in the second step, we are still in the E space, we know that any other points, any point different from the few green, see here, I don't know, can you see uh, my pointer here? There is no dot, but here I'm inside the niche. So if I go back to the geographical space, any point who has this value of high precipitation and uh, average temperature is good for the species here. So you can pro project back your niche from the E space to the G space. Now our workflow to make models is rather clear and defined. Start in a geographical space, uh, space uh, and uh, analyze uh, the relationship between any ecogeographical variable and presence point. Why? To obtain the best EGV set to exclude from the follow the sequence steps of the analysis any ecogeographical variable who is not meaningful. Go uh, step two in the environmental space and size up the niche. That is, ask your computer to draw this orange polygon. Measure the niche. Identify, uh, in one word, the determinants, the axis of the multivariate space defining the niche, and then go back to the Z space and use those optima you found. Uh, again, uh, I'm repeating in uh, a different way, slightly different way, what the workflow is. Start from the actual distribution, who is made by points. We are sure that there are places uh, either where uh, we were, weren't able to do because they were inaccessible, for instance, because you, you risk your uh, life going there, uh, or uh, simply uh, we weren't able to cover all the study area because uh, we didn't have time enough, we didn't have uh, people enough to go out and uh, collect data in the field. We have several uh, ecogeographical variables, either measured by us, you know, we, we can also work with satellite imagery to make uh, maps of vegetation, just to, to, to say one, but we uh, more often nowadays download ready-made data and work in the e space. The, the key of uh, species distribution modeling today is sizing up the ecological niche of the species in the best way, and then uh, spread that envelope back on the map in the G geographical space. So, what uh, uh, we saw uh, several minutes ago as a potential problem, as an issue with presence data, uh, because we didn't uh, have, we cannot have absence, it's really solved. We uh, analyze presence versus background, presence versus random. And what about the function? When we start modeling, the workhorse uh, for species distribution modeling was this one. I mean, don't be scared, uh, it's just the logistic regression. The logistic regression is a curve made more or less this way, a sigmoid curve, uh, whose values are always between zero and one. Zero, absence, one, uh, sure, 
uh, 100% probability of presence. But the mathematical model behind is really handy because any x, x1, x2, xn, has its coefficients, coefficient, that is, Greek letters are the weights of each variable we are looking for. And being the formula an exponential uh, divided by 1 plus the, plus the same exponential, you can have, thanks to uh, the exponential behavior, uh, any kind of variable. Uh, you are not, uh, as we uh, do one, uh, when we do regressions, linear regression, I mean, uh, you are not uh, blocked by data has to be normal, data has to be continuous, data can be anything. Also, uh, I, I don't know, aspect classes, north, northeast, not uh, degrees on a compass, but just the name, north. So you can use uh, uh, any kind of variable. This kind of model fitted well with the basic niche model, uh, the Hutchinson model, this one. We uh, talk about a few minutes ago. And then Soberon uh, and his colleagues came at the beginning of this century saying Hutchinson uh, wasn't wrong, but was, it, uh, was a tad blind because also plants do move. So we have to take into account a third per, uh, trait in our niche concept. We have all the abiotic factor, we have all the biotic factor, and uh, individuals choose or they are limited by the interaction of biotic factor and their, uh, their ecology, their life history. But the social movement, they are part of the distribution who can be uh, reach it, can't be reached because there's a barrier. And this was another of the big ideas of Wallace. Species uh, can uh, have origin uh, just for one reason, there are other uh, spe speciation mechanisms, you know, uh, just due to the insurgence of uh, geographical barriers. So a population of the same species remains isolated I don't know, by a mountain, by a ditch, by a river, by whatever, uh, and time passes, uh, uh, geological time passes, and you have a new species. This is a evolution in three words, I know, but the niche model behind that is not the Hutchinson model. It's a model, model that takes also into account movement. Furthermore, also in the G-space, uh, uh, niche can move, can evolve. Uh, think about at what's happening now uh, in the so-called Anthropocene uh, when our presence makes some animal become nocturnal, change completely their niche. You know? So the idea is to use a function who is able to define as tightly as possible that envelope in the E space. Uh, you see, bioclimatic model, all the modeling exercise you uh, see in any paper dealing with climate change are uh, more or less done in this way. You use, you know, climate is just two variables, rainfall and temperature. That's not third thing. Uh, climate is only made by precipitation and temperature. Sorry for being reductive, but this is the truth. So you make squares because we have just two variables. When I started modeling, uh, logistic regression was made using generalized linear models. So you made ellipses. Maxent is one of the best because can uh, use, you see here at bottom right, here, for the, uh, this part of the envelope, a square is the best approximation, and here is an, a, a potato and an irregular polygon. And Maxent can, it takes time to calculate all these things, but it, 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 it tries uh, and tries and tries and finds the best possible envelope. So this is the technique behind. And this solves the other half of the problem. Which kind of F? The function that approximates the tightest envelope and is up to the computer to find it. 
So our workflow, this is the same kind of drawing Francesco showed you, but declined in our case. As you see, there are two uh, production lines, one in orange that deals with the eco-geographical variable, download them, clip them, like uh, you do or your wives do uh, when they make uh, cookies. You know? I make cookie too uh, when we are around Christmas and I use something to clip the dog. So you download the elevation for, I don't know, uh, the whole area uh, of uh, Mongolia, but you have to work just uh, in the, the easternmost half. So it's useless. Uh, make your computer do calculation in the part that it won't be covered by your modeling exercise. Cut that part and throw it away. So clip all the data. Calculate the right var variables because uh, as we will see in a few moments, you can have almost anything from elevation. Create a pack of, vari of uh, variable and stop here because we have to wait for the presence data. Presence data can be dirty. We can have uh, outlier, we can have badly recorded presences, we can have uh, presence data we are not sure of. So, clean up the data, optionally generate random points, as many random points as um, the presence point you have, and check what is the best subset to make the model and just uh, only at this step make the model. So, some ideas uh, uh, to uh, go on and close up with our exercise. We have uh, more or less one hour left. Points. How to get in the real world uh, distribution data? Uh, you see, will see them as a point on the map, but they are not just points. Each point is a place, uh, latitude and longitude, or uh, any system of coordinates. Uh, but uh, we, we will use that point to measure what is here. If that point of presence has been recorded uh, with a, square, a survey made on squares, that point is not where the um, person in the field uh, saw an animal. It's the center of the square. So you are aware that you will measure elevation in, a, in the center of a 10 kilometers by 10 kilometer square that can contain almost any kind of elevation, because 10 kilometers uh, is rather wide. Points can be more dense, where it's easier for us to go surveying. So uh, we can expect we will have uh, much many points in the plane, uh, compared if points uh, we can obtain going uh, up climbing some mountain. Uh, distribution data take time to obtain, so uh, our points can uh, have different ages. How back in the time we must go uh, before deciding that those records are too old? We have some record for species presence that are uh, from uh, the beginning of the, the last century. Can we use them to model species presence nowadays? If you are doing a, a diachronic biogeography, uh, you have to model the species distribution 100 years ago, today, and given some um, uh, future climate scenario, how our species will be distributed, I don't know, in the next 50 years. So you do actually three models and you have to slice up your data according to a time axis. Points. Points, uh, they told me when I was in the first grade at school, uh, as a child, I mean, uh, points uh, have two dimensions, x and y. Which x and which way? You know, the Earth is not flat. This is a cartography problem. They sorted it out several centuries ago, uh, more or less uh, uh, half a thousand years ago, 500 years ago, at least in Europe. Uh, and now we have, uh, when you make maps, when you obtain points on a map, at least uh, 12,000 different coordinate systems 
there is not just latitude and longitude. If you deal with unprojected, uh, or how we say when we are uh, doing cartography with a computer, geographic uh, coordinate data, there are uh, actually uh, 600 different systems to express latitude and longitude, and different in differences in position in all the 600 systems can range from a few meters to uh, tenths of kilometers. So uh, that point, uh, once you join it, will you mix it with other points pertaining to your species in your study area, can move, can have a position that wasn't its uh, naive position. So the other point, uh, the difference comes from what is the history of uh, the origin of the point? Direct field service, it's me. Uh, I went with my GPS in the field. I know where uh, that point came from. Or I, I download, downloaded that point from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. The DISMO package in R uh, has commands to go fetch the point data you need from one of uh, uh, those uh, mega species distribution databases in the internet. Um, R uh, JBAF uh, sends an R agent uh, on the Global Biodiversity Information Facility servers to download points you need. Point can be repeated measure. We already talked about that. Uh, if it's easier. For a, for a human, go there and look for a species. Uh, in time, you will, points will accumulate in the places that are more easy to reach for us. Uh, problem is to be sure that you have covered the entire distribution of the species, also the most inaccessible areas. The, the probability to have a point of presence ultimately depends on the population density. The higher the population density, the higher the probability to spot at least an individual. So the uh, pattern of points you have can also be a function of the uh, density of populations in your steady area. Then there is the date problem. Data have a date and you can have stale data data that are too old to be used to model uh, present species distribution. Or, on the other hand, uh, you, if you are studying how distribution change through time, you can have data that are too recent to uh, build up what was the species distribution before a certain event. And last, uh, uh, just I've said, Remember that Earth uh, isn't flat. Uh, in most cases, you have points as latitude, longitude points. That's good because you have just uh, 6, diff uh, 600 sorry, different uh, uh, possibilities. But if you use latitude and longitude point, as for instance is written in any Maxent manual, that's wrong, you have a polygon on your GIS, whose coordinates are in degrees. And when you will ask your computer to size up that polygon, how many square kilometer is that polygon, you can do that. Or you will do that with a big error, because you know a longitude degree is uh, of variable length, because it's about uh, 111 kilometers at the equator and zero at the pole. This is not true for longitude because uh, uh, longitude is constant. So if we use data uh, not projected as geographical coordinate, we can calculate model as well. But next, when we use uh, the outcomes, we have some uh, round off problems. So better to stock data in latitude and longitude and first thing, project them in a Cartesian system using meters, feet, uh, whatever kind of linear unit you want. Another problem after uh, 
underestimated is how to store those points. This is uh, just uh, a reminder of all uh, the information you can store when you are child points for a possible future use in modeling. Where uh, did that point come from? A point ID and an identifier in the case we have to go back to trace the history of the point. Species, uh, if you are making a multi species database, why not? Uh, the coordinate, the uncertainty of the coordinates. Uh, did this point was born actually as a point? Someone seen an, a species there and had a GPS in, uh, in hand, or uh, it is the center of a square grid cell? It can be different. Uh, the country of collection, if you are working with transboundary species distribution or uh, on a national scale, the local administrative boundary, because perhaps you have to talk with a different uh, local administrator to try track the history of your point, the date, the date when that point was collected. So you can filter out uh, two old points or uh, use points up to a certain date. Who uh, identified the specimen if the point is a specimen? I don't, I don't know. Uh, either a killed animal uh, by a hunter or a specimen stored in a museum. Just to have the whole history of each and every point. What happens if you don't do that? It happens? What happens if you go on the Global Biodiversity Information Facility website and write wolf, canis, lupus, you know, Australia, look here, Australia is full of wolves. Figure out, they call them dingoes, you know, <laughs> they're stray dogs actually, <laughs> but taxonomically, the domestic dog is canis lupus, you know. So, uh, you have to be keen uh, of the nature of the data you are download downloading. Because wolf is here, wolf is here, but not in Australia as a dog, okay? So, uh, take care when you're downloading uh, data. I'm dealing with uh, presence data, but the same holds for ecogeographical variables. Be uh, aware of any possible map mashup. This is uh, the name uh, we currently give to this problem, to mix up uh, heterogeneous data, too much heterogeneous. Uh, more often, in the case of uh, the distribution data, we're coming from citizen science databases. Citizen science, science is a, a, a good thing uh, indeed, but citizen science with no filter at all uh, is uh, the startup for making make map mashup. You do mashup with potatoes, not with maps. So, just an example. Here, uh, uh, here we are in the northern part of Italy. You know, this kind of boot we call actually the boot is Italy. Uh, I'm talking uh, you from here, where I have my mouse, and it, it's a two hour drive by car. You go at the border with Switzerland, this thing here is Switzerland. Uh, we are in Sondrio province, uh, uh, the northernmost province of Lombardy region which is this part in the center of northern Italy. And the points you see are bear, brown bear observation. You know, 23 years ago, uh, the brown bear was reintroduced here in the neighboring region in Trentino Alto Adige, where the last surviving four uh, males <laughs> of brown bear were now we have a thriving population, and every now and then some bear comes here from the mountains, enters uh, in this valley, it's a long valley, it's called Valtellina, and uh, do what bears do <laughs> when they find sheep, when they find uh, beehives, and whatever. So those points are uh, bear presence records, and the, the ones you see in red are damages to uh, apiaries, to, to beekeepers, or to pastoralists, she mostly sheep. The question is, uh, there is a pattern where 
places in this valley are most suitable to uh, suffer a damage by bear. Problem is now, uh, what is our area of interest, which is something bigger than the study area, is something that surely contains our study area, is our geographical space. It exists really. So first, the problem is, and you will see that tomorrow with Francesco, how we can size up our study area uh, of uh, two possible solutions, choose one. Either you are constrained to use an administrative boundary, as in my case, this is the local administration, the, the province of Sondrio, this is its boundary, and I have to make calculation inside. Those two points are already in Switzerland, so I would rather exclude them. Or you are not bounded by a political administrative limit, so you can use just your points. So, in my case, the one you see in red was the boundary, because this was the local government that was asking me to do the model. <laughs> Simply that. Uh, you make a buffer, uh, given the scale of the area. Uh, in this case, I usually add uh, uh, 10 kilometers, so uh, is what you see in, uh, in that sort of brownish green. I enlarge my area because I don't want my model calculation go wrong nearby the boundary. I move the boundary outside so that what mathematicians and statisticians call boundary conditions happens, but happens outside of the area I'm interested in making prediction. You know, a calculation here can go wrong because nearby we have no data, because we will cut our data, because I cannot calculate this kind of thing for the whole planet I'm not interested in, and it takes years to do that. So I have to size up my data. And uh, the last thing I can do is to ask my GIS software to square up the buffer I've made. So in violet, now you see the minimum possible rectangle that contains my data with a, a wide enough border. So this is my area of interest in violet, the area of interest, there you are, the red rectangle is the cutter uh, we will use to shape up all my eco-geographical variables. Area of interest, AOI. And the boundary of the administrative region, the one in red here, is my study area. Study area is always inside the area of interest. And surely, my area of interest con contains all my points, and more often, this is also true for the study area. Maybe I can have, and I show you a case, some points that uh, falls outside. The rectangle of the area of interest can be projected in N as many uh, uh, coordinate reference system you need. Because, you know, eco-geographical variables don't came from a single source. So you will have elevation in a given project, cartographic projection, different from the projection you have from your point. And uh, the distance from rivers, you will calculate that starting from lines that are representing the rivers in your study area, but with a different projection from the elevation. So you will have to harmonize in a GIS, not in, you can do also that in R, you will see that Francesco has prepared some example for tomorrow, and uh, you do th this, you uh, can make this just because you have a several version of the cookie cutter of the area of interest projected in any possible projection system. You know, projecting a rectangle like this, uh, it's just four points, it takes less than one second. Uh, projecting or the elevation model you see here in this picture can take two or three hours on a fast machine with 20 processor and several gigabytes of RAM. So better 
uh, project the cookie cutter, cut off the slice you want of your uh, candidate ecogeographical variable, and then project uh, that small part of ecogeographical variable. Uh, in our scheme, in our workflow, let's go back to the workflow. I mean it just not to get lost. Where is my workflow? There you are. Um, this is clip and harmonize. And no, we have also to use uh, some care to shape up our presence data. That is, uh, for instance, to generate the, some pseudo absence point. Why? Uh, Maxent is able to create absence point by itself, but every run you make, you have, because they are random, different absence point. And in some cases, um, the best solution is to prepare a set of background point, of pseudo absence point, and use always those points in all your modeling exercise. So the background is always the same. Those points are generated at random, but just one time. There you are. Uh, the map we, I've shown you before, uh, blue dots uh, are bear presence, brown bear, I mean, red dots are uh, the images made by bear, and red triangle are point, 1,000 point, generated at random, and uh, the constraint is that no point can be uh, under 100 meter distance from each other. Uh, it, um, it took uh, two seconds to generate them using quantum GIS on, an, on, on a laptop, on an old laptop, figure it out. Uh, I generated uh, 1,000 random points, uh, as you can see, inside the area of interest. But you can also tell your GIS software to generate 1,000 points spaced uh, at least no less than 100 meters inside your study area. There you are, sir. Uh, it's really a matter of seconds. So those are the complete point set, presence versus background or pseudo absent. So we can build that niche model. Uh, at this, po uh, this point, uh, we have the point to make measures, but we are not sure yet on what uh, has to be measured. I mean, the ecogeographical variable. Also here, uh, I can show you my recipe. Is the recipe that most modelers use, but it's not uh, the, the absolute truth. Uh, substantially, you can have three sources, just three sources of ecogeographical variable. Precipitation and Temperature, I mean climate, I will go back to climate sources in a, in a while. Elevation, and uh, everything can be derived from elevation. Uh, if you download the digital elevation model, this is a raster map, huh? uh, in the worst case you have global planetary scale data set, and the, the, the pixel is more or less one kilometer, actually 20, um, 30, sorry, 30 uh, arc seconds. Uh, 30 arc seconds at the equator are more or less one kilometer. If you go northwards or southwards, they become less than, thir uh, than one kilometer. You go up to, uh, to half these sides. Uh, from the elevation, you can calculate almost everything has to do with terrain uh, shape and form, elevation, aspect, terrain roughness, uh, figure out, you can also calculate solar radiation per year. It takes one week because uh, your computer has to calculate solar radiation for each day, for each hour, for a whole year. So multiply 60 by 24 by uh, 365. And this is the number of iteration your computer has to do, and the bigger the study area, I calculated that uh, two or three years ago for uh, all Italy, which is a small country, and it took uh, four days on a fast machine. But uh, you won't find on the internet a slope map, because um, it is a nonsense. You download elevation, 
and calculate the first derivative. The first derivative of elevation is the slope. The gradient of the elevation is the aspect, not north, south, east, east, and whatever. The second important source are land cover or land use map. Uh, there's a sort of philosophical distinction between what is land cover and what is land use, but for our purposes, uh, it's the same. Uh, a map maker who may, makes uh, land cover maps uh, uh, would kill me for this, but for us, a species distribution model is the same. There are maps, vector maps, polygon maps, uh, who represent what is over the surface of the Earth. Problem is that the land cover classes are made for a particular species, that is us, Homo sapiens, you know, agricultural, uh, dense woodland, uh, but that kind of woodland is still dense for a deer uh, or is not dense at all for a bird. So it's a point of view problem and more, more often you have to, you have to uh, reclassify according to what is known of the habitat preferences of your species. You can also uh, uh, have some minor uh, but uh, uh, yet important sources as road networks because uh, distance from roads and distance from railroads as well uh, is one of the best indexes we have of human presence, of human disturbance. You can also make Models within models, because one, uh, think about um, an apex predator, predator uh, if you are modeling the probability of presence of a, a predator, maybe a model that shows us the probability of presence of a prey species can be used, and often it is, as an ecogeographical variable, and uh, if you think about it, 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 it perfectly makes sense. For the uh, choice of the ecogeographical variable, uh, it holds the bad apple theorem. You know, uh, a bad apple can spoil the entire barrel, they say. And if you have just one single ecogeographical variable with a big pixel, I don't know, 10 kilometers, all the other ecogeographical variables you have uh, is not important that you um, manage to obtain that, I don't know, at uh, 100 meters pixel size, because you cannot uh, pull your variable at 10 kilometers to a 100 meter resolution. You cannot reconstruct what was inside the big pixel but you can sum up small pixels into big one. So be careful when you have to choose, I don't know, you have precipitation for your area, both at one kilometer and 50 kilometer scale. Use the smallest, use 10 kilometer. But you have elevation at 10 meters, and you have to reduce elevation to 10 kilometers because it is no, no sense. Or you have to exclude precipitation for from your analysis. When you deal with climate, I mean elevation, uh, sorry, precipitation and temperature, often it is no use uh, dealing also with land cover. You know, vegetation primarily, uh, botanists uh, told us uh, years ago to me, and I think if someone of you, he's a botanist or knows a botanist, will we'll agree with this, rainfall and temperature determine the vegetation you have in any area, also in deserts. So problem is that you are dealing with uh, climate variable, you can exclude as well land use because they are redundant. They are linked each other, strongly linked each other. If you need climate data, it's like uh, nowadays uh, going to the supermarket thanks uh, to uh, the guy you see uh, in the picture at top right is called Robert Bob uh, for Fred Hemans. Uh, and Bob Hemans uh, now is uh, going retired uh, at the end of uh, 2022. He will retire, he's a geographer. Uh, he, he works uh, at the University of California at Davis and is the father of World Clean, now to the second edition. 
you know, world clean is like that, that uh, pre-cooked uh, uh, place you buy at the supermarket just, just three minutes in the, in the microwave and it's ready to eat. So you can download BioClean one kilometer special resolution for the entire planet and you also have the past and the future climate scenarios ready to use. Just cut and heat a bit. So you see you have 19 bioclimatic variable, uh, bio one temperature, uh, yearly mean, but bio four, uh, the seasonality index, the higher the number, the harsh is the difference between winter and summer. So you have everything you can use, uh, not being a climatologist, as Bob Heeman is, actually it was, because now uh, he has become the father of both world claim and the father, you will see that tomorrow, of a part of this mode because uh, uh, the, our raster package, that is all the functions that R needs to go, uh, go with raster maps, are uh, uh, in uh, large part have been written by this guy here, by Bob Hemans, to make the uh, World Clean data set. So uh, if you have to uh, add in your model uh, climate variables, uh, don't hesitate using World Clean. It's uh, already made. So, you can calculate derived ecogeographical variables. I already made the example of the wealth of data you can have just from one uh, GIS uh, uh, coverage, that is the elevation. Distances from road, from rivers, from urban areas, from ski resorts, from whatever you need. The results is this one. This is the output you have when you ask our to plot an ecogeographical stack. And you see Bio 1, Bio 2, Bio 3, Bio 4 and Bio 5, we uh, did not need them, Bio 6, uh, those are BioClean variable, thanks to Bob Hemans. Uh, GTOPO 30 is a worldwide digital elevation model, figure out why the 30 at 30 arc seconds at a kilometer for all the Italian area. Those uh, last two rows are land, land cover. PCT stays for percent. Percent of one, urban areas. Percent of two, agricultural areas. And on and on and on. You go, uh, I'm uh, up to the last steps uh, before modeling. Uh, the question now is, but all these eco-geographical variables, how much are related? Uh, each other. Uh, how high is the redundancy I have in my ecogeographical variable? Just do a cluster analysis, just do a correlation analysis. You see, urban and agricultural are highly related. Why? Because where you inhabit, you don't have fields. So there's a negative relationship. Steep, uh, steepness and roughness of the terrain of course, are related. Uh, shrubs, uh, sorry for the variable names in Italian, this is Arbustis shrubs. Shrubs uh, uh, is, is strongly linked with woodlands and loosely linked with steep area, negative correlation. So, problem is to identify all the possible pairs of variables, which basically are telling you the same story and exclude from the analysis one of them. Which one? You are free to choose. Uh, the, the idea is uh, choose uh, the one is uh, more easy to deal with. Uh, I don't know. Uh, here, slope and water. I will, I will take distance from water. Uh, is more meaningful to reason about uh, with respect to slope. So this is called a selection of ecogeographical variable and the steps are two. One, use the correlation and the second, calculate a statistics called the variance inflection factor. That is how much a variable can be predicted from all the other. 
So you have a YIF score for each variable, and you exclude for the analysis all the variable who have a too high uh, score using uh, that grain of south, for instance. You see here that distance from road number eight and distance for minor roads, I mean forest roads, have actually far high a VIAF value. So, uh, by the book, I should exclude them. And instead, in this particular modeling exercise, I decided to keep distance from minor road. Because if you look here, if we exclude both number 8 and number 17, no, uh, sorry, number 18, that is distant from any kind of road, in my set, I don't have no predictor at all of human disturbance, except distance from inhabited areas, which is another kind of disturbance with respect of the kind of disturbance you have by a minor forest road. So, last step before modeling, making a mess. <laughs> that's, a joke, that's a pun in the name of the map. Actually, mess means multivariate environmental similarity surface. Uh, sounds serious. No? Uh, making a mess, map, not making a mess, uh, means uh, asking your computer how much you will extrapolate in the area where your points are not present. You remember the modeling exercise, we are closing the circle, uh, is go from the geographical space into the ecological space, size up the niche, then go back into the geographical space and spread, uh, identify where in your niche envelope uh, each point in the geographical space falls. What about points that weren't sample? Points that are here, like here where I have the mouse, in the northern part of the north, the Sondra province, province. He, here is a high mountain. No one went, uh, possibly neither a bear went here. So we have no points here. How much my model will extrapolate? Uh, it's a number that uh, has a negative value. It goes from uh, something slightly more than uh, 0 to 10 to uh, minus uh, 12,000. The uh, higher the negative values, the higher is the risk to extrapolate. So you see in this map in orange areas here, 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 in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the bottom of the valley mostly. So. I am confident now, looking at the mass map, that my model will not extrapolate too much. Then, and I'm skipping this part, not for time limits, we have uh, the last 15 minutes, uh, but because it is what you'll see tomorrow with Francesco, you make a model. You make the model, uh, you will see tomorrow, and you uh, will have, firstly, to judge how uh, your model is good at predicting. Given that uh, with a mass map, with a variance inflection factor, with the correlation between ecogeographical variable, with the cleanup you've made on presence point, um, eliminating points that are too dense, for instance, like here and like here, these points are, are still dense, even if I ask my GIS software to decimate points. Why they are still dense here? Uh, it is readily explained because bears come from this part. This is Trentino region, the neighboring region where uh, brown bear are be, has been reintroduced 22 years ago, and this is the corridor where animals come. So it's uh, correct that here we have a high density of points. In the rest of the province, if you take a look, the density is more or less the same because I have decimated, I have eliminated redundant points. Here, the decimation job worked up to a certain point because here points were actually denser. So, you have a look at this kind of curve who's called the receiver operating curve. 
uh, there's no receiver and there's no transmitter in our model, but this curve wa was invented during World War, uh, War II to test for the accurateness of radar measurements. So the receiver was the receiver of a radar system. And the idea is, you see the axis, they both are probabilities. They are scaled between 0 and 1 on the x and by 0 and 1 on the way. And what you are plotting here, you are plotting what mean 1 minus specificity. That is, specificity is the ability to have uh, false negatives. And here you are the sensitivity, which is the opposite. 1 minus the probability to add false positive. You are asking your model how good it is in avoiding making the two possible kinds of false prediction. That is, saying that as, um, um, an area on the map is good for the species when instead it is not, or this is a false positive, or making false negatives, saying that an area, an area is bad for a species when actually it is not. The two things are not related. Ask a statistician for details. So this black line, which is the diagonal of the, the graph, is uh, the way the uh, most simple and ancient predictor, I mean a towing cost, uh, works. That is to say, if you toss an honest coin, like was uh, my professor of statistics saying when I was a student, let's take a coin and toss it, maybe a honest, or let's roll a dice, a honest dice, uh, this is the 50% probability line. If your receiver operating curve is far from the uh, uh, coin toss line, let's call it this way, the far is it, the better is your model. So this model has an area, look here, AUC, an area under the curve that is 83.9, uh, 84%. Uh, this value is uh, actually the integral of this curve, but being the axis 0 to 1 and 0 to 1, uh, the whole, uh, the entire, the, in the undefined integral is 1. So the closer to 1 is this figure, the better is your model. You see the blue area here because I've made uh, 100 replicas of the same model and uh, I uh, managed to have some standard errors. Okay, so more or less my area is 83.9% uh, plus or minus standard deviation you see in uh, red. So my model is rather good. Uh, as a rule of thumb from uh, 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 0.7 upwards, your model is affordable, it's good. Uh, a note, if you happen having a, an ROC curve that goes well under, I mean specular to this one we are seeing, well under the 50% line, the coin toss line, your model is right, just do the opposite, okay? Another thing you have to look uh, before making the map is the weight of the uh, ecogeographical variable. You always have a plot like this one, a variable contribution plot. And in this case, uh, uh, this is referred to the variables I've shown you before, those one. And you see that the most outstanding variable uh, almost 30% contribution here is the elevation, g top, of, g top of 30. The second most important, up to 22%, is bio 12. Who is bio 12? Let's go back a tad, because it says bio clean, bio 12. Oh, where are you? Bio 12 is rainfall, annual precipitation. So the picture of the niche uh, gradually came come out. The third one, Bio7, Bio7, who are you, Bio7? So what you will do tomorrow with Francesco will be this kind of work. Bio7, the annual 
temperature range, year maximum and yearly minimum. Does it make sense for a for bear in a mountain area? Of course. So you explore all the results. Uh, note that when we start with uh, land cover bio, land cover variable, the first one, but less than 5% effect, uh, negligible, I would say. Uh, bio 15, uh, who is bio 15? Bio 15 is uh, uh, the seasonality index and so on. So you explore the results, the machine, uh, the model making machine uh, prepared and ask yourself, but are those results sound from an ecological point of view? Is it the way a brown bear uh, would choose? Yes. So this is our map and we have uh, it's uh, 20 past 10 and so this will be the last of our problems. The standard representation you have, because your uh, species distribution map uh, model, sorry, your species distribution model is the, the ecological space projected back into the geographical space. So you have a map to look at. And uh, here you see white is suitable, black is not suitable. That is, black is something near to zero and white is something near to one because the outcome of your modeling exercise are values, are probabilities, are values between zero and one. Problem. But where can I place a limit below which we can call it absence and uh, upwards we can call it suitable presence where is red uh, unsuitable habitat and where is green you know when you work with maps on a gis you uh, color your maps by numbers so at uh, what level we can cut off of course uh, uh, 0 0.5 that is 50 percent is not the right answer so last problem you have to cope with is to identify a cutoff a value which is the boundary between suitable and unsuitable uh, of course this is calculated from models uh, from the model outcome there are uh, up to now up, up to the, the literature i am familiar with at least 12 ways to do that two of them are the most common and this is the commonest at all hey but this is this is the rock cure yes it has a second use if you take uh, the other diagonal the opposite uh, to the coin toss remember uh, line you surely have this red line intersect your curve at a given point okay conduct the perpendicular to that, and you are here on the x-axis, uh, 0 0.25. This is your cutoff. This is, uh, apart from the graphic solution, there you are. Uh, this is the value that gives you contemporarily the maximum sensitivity and the maximum specificity. That is to say, your model uh, at the same time is able to keep as low as possible both sources of error, both the false positive and the false negative. So this is the uh, easiest and uh, uh, most efficient way in specifying a cutoff. That is to say, I can go back to my GIS, uh, remember these are not colors, they are numbers, and say to my GIS, uh, cancel all the pixel whose value is less than 0 0.25 and use a scale of greens, because I like green, no, actually I like fuchsia, uh, use greens to color all the points. The greener they are, the closer they are to one. And, sorry, there we are. I warned you I love fuchsia, sorry, <laughs> but yellowish 
and the oranges are value from 0 0.25 to 0 0.5. 0 0.5 to 0 0.65 are orange. 0 0.65 to 1 is uh, fuchsia. So, uh, three classes just uh, to, um, to have uh, uh, something uh, neat to see, but these three uh, boundaries are absolutely uh, artificial. I have not calculated them. Uh, where you see something colored is suitable. So this is one of the possible final outcomes, that is a probability of presence for the brown bear in Valtellina. Right? That is to say, uh, a species distribution model. You can do that also repeating the exercise for most species. Just one example, that's not me. It's a girl from the other part of the world, I mean South Africa. And uh, Rachel, Rachel Copperbano and colleagues uh, did uh, a tad of years ago uh, a species distribution model for each bat species present in South Africa, which is uh, 10 times bigger than Italy. And you see here at top right, different colors means uh, different biodiversity. There we are. This is species richness, blue, uh, one to three, four to six bat species. Uh, brick red means up to 24 bat species. So where uh, do we have uh, the, the famous biodiversity hotspots? Here, look at figure B, okay? And figure A and figure C and figure E and figure D are different climatic scenarios because you can, once you calculate the model, you can substitute uh, rainfall and temperature with rainfall and temperature calculated for the future, possibly not by a zoologist, by Bob Hemans, by a climatologist, a competent climatologist. Uh, I will stop here in uh, perfect time, uh, I think, and I thank you for your attention. And if you have some questions, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Damiano. Yes, perfectly in time. It was like 4.30 when you said that you were done. So I made my rehearsal this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, today, this was like a very interesting and uh, I think uh, we, we all will probably have, like, we'll need a little time just to go through the lesson and the slides again and keep everything in mind uh, and getting ready for next uh, class that will be on Thursday, same place, same time. But I will leave now um, to, I will leave it now to anybody who may have questions. And you can also type it in the chat if you prefer. Oh, sure. Prefer. With the exception of Jeff and also Victoria, I think no one here is a native English speaker. <laughs> if you prefer writing, uh, do that. Don't hesitate. No questions? Ooh. No question. Thank you. It's like the excess problems. Uh, it means that uh, either I've been crystal clear or I've completely fried your brains and I apologize for this. Oh, today's so, lecture very interesting and many nice information. I think our guys is thinking how to use this tool. this kind of the... information, uh, just a suggestion, maybe the scheme, this is the original I presented you uh, in my slides because tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, uh, Thursday, sorry, you will repeat all these uh, two hours, but uh, from the hands on side with Francesco and with, the, with your data. Oh, very interesting. Someone is already expecting about this type of the data analysis. Oh, you, will, you will have two or three. 
uh, I can do this kind of anticipation without spoiling the result. You will have two or three funny surprises. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, but uh, me and Francesco, Francesco first, uh, because uh, the data treatment has been made entirely by Francesco, uh, I only work as an advisor, uh, decided to keep uh, all the, the niceties, all the errors, all uh, the pebbles in the shoe you can encounter when you start a modeling exercise, which is not uh, what happens on textbooks. On textbooks, you have uh, always those kind of perfect reality, which is not real. So um, on Thursday, you will see also uh, what kind of errors can happen and most important, how can they be uh, dealt with and solved. So if you have no other questions, I can wish you a good evening. And we'll see you next uh, Thursday, uh, same uh, time, same channel, like on TV. Yes. Uh -huh. Bye, everyone. Have a nice evening. Thank you.